I'm just going to try and find a picture I can use for some reason it's not showing up.
guess I'm just going to rewrite here. I'll just set it that right there. Okay, this is going to have to do. The science of martial arts, called the individual school of two skies, is something that I have spent many years refining. Now wishing to reveal it in the book for the first time, I have ascended Mount Diwato in the Higo province of Kyushu. Bowing to heaven, paying respect to Kanon, I face the Buddha. I am Shinmen Musashi no Kami Fujiwara no Genshin. A warrior born in the province of Harima, now 60 years old. I have set my mind on the science of martial arts since my youth long ago. I was 13 years old when I had my first duel. On that occasion, I won over my opponent, a martial artist named Arima Kihe of the New School of Accuracy. At 16 years of age, I beat a powerful martial artist called Akiyama of Tajima province. When I was 21, I went to the capital and met martial artists from all over the country, although I engaged in numerous duels, and never did I fail to attain victory. After that, I traveled from province to province, meeting martial artists of the various schools, although I dueled more than 60 times, never once did I lose. That all took place between the time I was 13 years old in the time I was 29, when I had passed the age of 30 and reflected on my experiences, I realized that I had not been victorious because of consummate attainment of martial arts. Perhaps it was because I had an inherent skill for the science and had not deviated from natural principles. It may have also been due to shortcomings in the martial arts of other schools. In any case, I subsequently practiced day and night in order to attain an even deeper principle and spontaneously came upon the science of martial arts. I was about 50 years old at the time. Since then, I have passed the time with no science into which to inquire, trusting in the advantage of military science as I turn into the sciences of all arts and skills. I have no teacher in anything. Now when composing this book, I have not borrowed the old sayings of Buddhism or Confucianism nor do I make use of old stories from military records or books on military science. With heaven and canon for mirrors, I take upon the brush and begin to write at 4 a.m. on the night of the 10th day of the 10th month, 1643. And there is the first page. Sorry, I have to get a drink of water. Sorry, I'm checking something real quick. begin the first part, the Earth Scroll. Martial arts are the warrior's way of life. Commanders in particular should practice these arts, and soldiers must also know this way of life. 
in the present day, there are no warriors with certain knowledge of the way of martial arts. First, let us illustrate the idea of a way of life. Buddhism is a way of helping people. Confucianism is a way of reforming culture. For the physician, healing is a way of life. A poet teaches the art of poetry. Others pursue fortune-telling, archery, or various other arts and crafts. People practice the ways to which they are inclined, developing individual preferences. Few people are fond of the martial way of life. First of all, the way of warriors means familiarity with both cultural and martial arts. Even if they are clumsy at this, individual warriors should strengthen their own martial arts as much as practical in their circumstances. People usually think that all warriors think about is being ready to die. As far as the way of death is concerned, it is not limited to warriors. Mendicants, women, farmers, and even those below them know their duty, are ashamed to neglect it, and resign themselves to death. There is no distinction in this respect. The martial way of life practiced by warriors is based on excelling others in anything and everything, whether by victory in an individual duel or by winning a battle with several people. One thinks of serving the interests of one's employer, of serving one's own interests, of becoming well-known and socially established. This is all possible by the power of martial arts. Yet, there would be people in the world that think that even if you learn martial arts, this will not prove useful when a real need arises. Regarding that concern, the true science of martial arts means practicing them in such a way that they will be useful at all times and to teach them in such a way that they will be useful in all things. In China and Japan, practicers of this science have been referred to as masters of martial arts. Warriors should not fail to learn this science. People who make a living as martial artists these days only do with swordsmanship. The priests of the Kashima and Kantori shrines in Hitachi province have established such schools claiming their teachings to have been transmitted from the gods, and travel around from province to province, passing them on to people, but this is actually a recent phenomenon. Among the arts and crafts Among the arts and crafts spoken of since ancient times, the so-called art of the advantage has been included as a craft. So once we were talking about the art of the advantage, it cannot be limited to swordsmanship alone. Even swordsmanship itself can hardly be known by considering only on how to win by the art of the sword alone. Without question, it is impossible to master military science thereby. As I see society, people make the arts into commercial products. They think for themselves as commodities and also make implements as items of commerce. Distinguishing the superficial and the substantial, I find this attitude is less reality than decoration field of martial arts is particularly rife, with flamboyant showmanship, with commercial popularization and profiteering on the part of those who teach the science and those who study it. The results of this, as someone said, that amateuristic martial arts are a source of serious wounds. Generally speaking, there are four walks of life, the way of the knight, the farmer, the artisan, and the merchant. First is the way of the farmer. Farmers prepare all sorts of agricultural tools and spend the year constantly attending to the changes in the four seasons. This is the way of the farmer. Second is the way of the merchant. Those who manufacture wine obtain the very simple means required and make a living from the profit they gain according to quality. Whatever the business, merchants make a living from the profits they earn according to their particular status. This is the way of the merchant. Third, in regards to the warrior knight, that path involves constructing all sorts of weapons and understanding the various properties of weapons. This is imperative for warriors. Failure to master weaponry and comprehend the specific advantages of each weapon would seem to indicate a lack of cultivation in a member of a warrior house. Fourth is the way of the artisan. In terms of the way of the carpenter, this involves useful, skillful construction of all sorts of tools, knowing how to use each tool skillfully, drawing up plans correctly by means of the square and the ruler, making a living by diligent practice of the craft. These are the four walks of life of knights, farmers, artisans, and merchants. 
I will illustrate the science of martial arts by likening it to the way of the carpenter. The carpenter is used this metaphor in reference to the notion of a house. We speak of aristocratic houses, military houses, houses of the arts. We speak of a house collapsing or a house continuing. And we speak of such and such a tradition, style, or quotation mark, house. Since we use the expression house, therefore, I have employed the wave of the master carpenter as a metaphor. The word for carpenter is written with characters meaning great skill or master plan. Since the science of martial arts includes great skills and master planning, I'm writing about it in terms of comparison with carpentry. If you want to learn the science of martial arts, meditate on this book. Let the teacher be the needle, let the student be the thread, and practice unrel unremittingly. As the master carpenter is the overall organizer and director of the carpenters, it is the duty of the master carpenter to understand the regulations of the country, find out the regulations of the locality, and attend to the regulations of the master carpenter's own establishment. The master carpenter, knowing the measurements and designs of all sorts of structures, employs people to build houses in this respect. The master carpenter is the same as the master warrior. When sorting out timber for building a house, that which is straight, free from knots, and of good appearance can be used for front pillars. That which has some knots but is straight and strong can be used for rear pillars. That which is somewhat weak yet has no knots and looks good is variously used for door sills, lintels, doors, and screens. That which is knotted and crooked but nevertheless strong is used thoughtfully in consideration of the strength of the various members of the house. Then, the house will last a long time. Even knotted, crooked, and weak timber can be made into scaffolding and later used for firewood. As the master carpenter directs the journeyman, he knows their various levels of skill and gives them appropriate tasks. Some are assigned to the floor, some to the doors and screens, some to the sills, lentils, and ceilings, and so on. He has the unskilled sit out floor joists and gets those even less skilled to carve wedges. When the master carpenter exercises discernment in the assignment of jobs, the work progresses smoothly. Efficiency and smooth progress, prudence in all matters, recognizing true courage, recognizing different levels of morale, instilling confidence and realizing what can and cannot be reasonably expected, such are the matters on the mind of the master carpenter. The principle of martial arts is like this. Speaking in terms of carpentry, soldiers sharpen their own tools, make various useful implements, and keep them in their utility boxes. Receiving various instructions from a master carpenter, they hew pillars and beams with odds, shave floors and ceilings with shelves with planes, even carve open work in bas relief, making sure the measurements are correct. They see to all the necessary tasks in an efficient manner. This is the rule for carpentry. When no one has developed a practical knowledge of all the skills of the craft, eventually one can become a master carpenter oneself. An essential habit for carpenters is to have sharp tools and keep them wetted. It is up to the carpenter to use these tools masterfully even making such things as miniature shrines, bookshelves, tables, lampstands, cutting boards, and pot covers. Being soldiers like this, this should be given careful reflection. Necessary accomplishments of a carpenter are avoiding crookedness, getting joints to fit together, skillful planing, avoiding abrasion, <clears throat> and seeing that there is no subsequent warping. If you want to learn the science, then take everything I write to heart and think over it carefully. Distinguishing five courses in order to explain their principles in individual sections, I've written this book in five scrolls entitled Earth, Water, Fire, Wind, and Emptiness. And the Earth Scroll is an outline of the science of martial arts, the analysis of my individual school. The true science cannot be attained just by mastery of swordsmanship alone. Knowing the small by way of the great, one goes from the shallow of the deep shallow to the deep, because a straight path levels the contour of the earth I call the first one the earth scroll. Second is the water scroll. Taking water is the basic point of reference. One makes the mind fluid. 
water conforms to the shape of the vessel, square or round. It can be a drop and it can be an ocean. Water has the color of a deep pool of aquamarine. Because of the purity of water, I write about my individual school in this scroll. When you attain certain discernment of the principles of mastering swordsmanship, then when you can defeat one opponent at will, this is tantamount to being able to defeat everyone in the world. The spirit of overcoming others is the same even if there are thousands or tens of thousands of opponents. The military science of commanders is to construe the large scale from the small scale, like making a monumental icon from a miniature model. Such matters are impossible to write about in detail. To know myriad things by means of one thing is the principle of military science. I write about my individual school in this water scroll. The third is the fire scroll. In this scroll, I write about battle. Fire may be large or small and has a sense of violence, so here I write about matters of battle. The way to do battle is the same whether it is a battle between one individual and another or a battle between one army and another. You should observe reflectively with overall awareness of the large picture as well as precise attention to small details. The large scale is easy to see. The small scale is hard to see. To be specific, it is impossible to reverse the direction of a large group of people all at once, while the small scale is hard to know because in the case of an individual, there is just one will involved and changes can be made quickly. This should be given careful consideration because the matters in this fire school are things that happen in flash. In martial arts, it is essential to practice daily to attain familiarity, treating them as ordinary affairs so the mind remains unchanged. Therefore, I write about contest and battle in this fire scroll. Fourth is the wind scroll. The reason I call this scroll the wind scroll is that it's not about my individual school. This is where I write about the various schools of martial arts in the world. As far as using the word wind is concerned, we use this word to mean style or manner and speaking of such things as ancient style, contemporary style, and the manners of the various houses. So here, I write definitively about the techniques of the various schools of martial arts in the world. This is wind. Unless you really understand others, you can hardly attain your own self-understanding. In the practice of every way of life and every kind of work, there is a state of mind called that of the deviant. Even if you strive diligently on your chosen path day after day, if your heart is not in accordance with it, then even if you think you are on a good path from the point of view of the straight and true, this is not a genuine path. If you do not pursue a genuine path to its consummation, then a little bit of crookedness in the mind will later turn into a major warp. Reflect on this. It is no wonder that the world should consider the martial arts to consist solely of swordsmanship. As far as the principles and practices of my martial art are concerned, this is a distinctly different matter write about the other schools in this one scroll in order to make the martial arts of the world known. Fifth is the emptiness scroll. This reason the scroll is called emptiness is because that once we speak of emptiness we can no longer define the inner depths and terms of the surface entryway. Having attained a principle, one detaches from the principle. Thus one is spontaneous independence in the science of martial arts and naturally attains marvels discerning the rhythm when the time comes, one strikes spontaneously and naturally scores. This is all the way of emptiness. In the emptiness school, I have written about spontaneous entry into the true way. The point of talking about two swords is that it's the duty of all warriors, commanders, and soldiers alike to wear two swords. In olden times, these were called tachi in the kata, in katana. Or the great sword and the sword. Nowadays they are called katana and wakizashi, or the sword and the sidearm. There is no need for a detailed discussion of the business of warriors wearing these two swords. In Japan, the way of warriors is to wear them at their sides whether they know anything about them or not. It is in order to convey the advantages of these two that I call my school two swords in one. As for the spear, the halberd, and so on, they are considered extra accoutrements. They are among the tools of the warrior. For beginners in my school, the real thing is to practice the science wielding both swords, the long sword in one hand and the short sword in the other. 
when your life is on the line, you want to make use of all your tools. No warrior should be willing to die without, with his swords at his side without having made use of his tools. However, when you hold something with both hands, you cannot wield it freely both right and left. My purpose is to get you used to wielding the long sword with one hand. With large weapons such as the spear and the halberd, there is no choice, but the long and short swords are both weapons that can be held in one hand. The trouble with wielding a long sword with both hands is that it's no good on horseback, no good when running hurriedly, no good on marshy ground, muddy fields, stony plains, steep roads, or crowded places. When you have a bow or a spear in your left hand or whatever other weapon you are wielding, in any case, you can use the long sword with one hand. Therefore, to wield the long sword with both hands is not the true way. When it is impossible to strike a killing blow using just one hand, then use two hands to do it. It should not require effort. Two swords is a way to learn to wield the long sword in one hand whose purpose is first to accustom people to wielding the long sword in one hand. The long sword seems heavy and unwieldy to everyone at first, but everything is like that when you first take it up. A bow is hard to draw, a halberd is hard to swing. In any case, when you become accustomed to each weapon, you become stronger at the bow, and you acquire the ability to wield the long sword. It's when you attain the power of the way, it becomes easy to handle. To swing the longsword with great velocity is not the right way, as will be made clear in the second section, the water scroll. The longsword is to be wielded in spacious places, the short sword in confined spaces. This is the basic idea of the way to begin with. In my individual school, one can win with the longsword and one can win with the short sword as well. For this reason, the precise size of the longsword is not fixed. The way of my school is the spirit of gaining victory by any means. It is better to wield two swords than one long sword when you are battling a mob all by yourself. It is also advantageous when taking prisoners. Matters such as this need not to be written out in exhaustive detail. Myriad things are to be inferred from each point. When you have mastered the practice of the science of martial arts, there will be nothing you do not see. This should be given careful and thorough reflection. In this path, someone who has learned to wield the long sword is customarily called a martial artist in our society. In the profession of martial arts, one who can shoot a bow well is called an archer, while one who has learned to use a gun is called a gunner. <clears throat> one who has learned to use a spear is called a lancer, while one who has learned to use a halberd is called a halberd here. If we follow this pattern, one who has learned the way of the sword would be called a long swordsman and a side armsman. Since the bow, the gun, the spear, and the halberd are all tools of warriors, all of them are avenues of martial arts. Nevertheless, it is logical to speak all martial arts in specific reference to the long sword, because society and individuals are both ordered by way of the powers of the long sword. Therefore, the long sword is the origin of martial arts. When you have attained the power of the longsword, you can single-handedly prevail over ten men. When it is possible to overcome ten men single-handedly, then it is possible to overcome a thousand men with a hundred, and to overcome ten thousand men with a thousand. Therefore, in the martial arts of my individual school, it is the same for one man as it is for ten thousand. All the science of warriors, without exception, are called martial arts. As far as paths concerned, there are Confucianists, Buddhists, tea connoisseurs, teachers of etiquette, dancers, and so on. These things do not exist in the way of warriors. But even if they are not your path, if you have wide knowledge of the ways, you encounter them in all things. In any case, as human beings, it is essential for each of us to cultivate and polish our individual path. In distinguishing the advantages of the tools of warriors, find that whatever the weapon, there is a time and situation in which it is appropriate. The sidearm or short sword is most advantageous in confined spaces or at close quarters when you get right up close to an opponent. The long sword generally has appropriate uses in any situation. The halberd seems to be inferior to the spear on the battlefield. 
The spear is the vanguard, the halberd, the rear guard. Given the same degree of training, one with the spear is a bit stronger. Both the spear and the halberd depend on circumstances. Neither is very useful in crowded situations. They are not even appropriate for taking prisoners. They should be reserved for use on the battlefield. They are essential weapons in pitched battle. If you nevertheless learn to use them indoors, focusing attention on petty details and such losing the real way, they will hardly prove suitable. The bow is also suitable on the battlefield for making strategic charges and retreats because it can be fired rapidly at a moment's notice from the ranks of the lancers and others. It is particularly good for battle in the open fields. It is inadequate, however, for sieging a castle and for situations where the opponent is more than 40 yards away. In the present age, not only the bow, but also the other arts have more flowers than fruit. Such skills are useless when there is a real need. Inside castle walls, nothing compares to a gun. Even in an engagement in the open fields, there are many advantages to a gun before the battle has begun. Once the ranks have closed in battle, however, it is no longer adequate. One virtue of the bow is that you can see the trail of the arrows you shoot, which is good. An inadequacy of the gun is that the path of the bullets cannot be seen. This should be given careful consideration. As for horses, it is essential for them to have powerful stamina and not be temperamental. Speaking in general terms of the tools of the warrior, one's horses should strike grandly, one's longs and short swords should cut grandly, one's spear and halberd should penetrate grandly, and one's bow and gun should be strong and accurate. You should not have any special fondness for a particular weapon or anything else for that matter. Too much is the same as not enough. Without imitating anyone else, you should have as much weaponry as suits you. To entertain likes and dislikes is bad for both commanders and soldiers. Pragmatic thinking is essential. Sorry, I think I'm going to get a drink in a second. get some water. Oh, now do you command a route? Oh, how are things going? And I am back. I had to refill my water bottle. On 
rhythm in martial arts. Rhythm is something that exists in everything, but the rhythms of martial arts in particular are difficult to master without practice. Rhythm is manifested in the world in such things as dance and music, pipes and strings. These are all harmonious rhythms. In the field of martial arts, there are rhythms and harmonies in archery, gunnery, and even horsemanship. In all arts and sciences, rhythm is not to be ignored. There is even rhythm in being empty. In the professional life of the warrior, there are rhythms of rising to office and rhythms of stepping down, rhythms of fulfillment and rhythms of disappointment. In the field of commerce, there are rhythms of becoming rich and rhythms of losing one's fortune. Harmony and disharmony in rhythm occur in every walk of life. It is imperative to distinguish carefully between the rhythms of flourishing and the rhythms of decline in every single thing. The rhythms for the martial arts are varied. First, know the right rhythms and understand the wrong rhythms and discern the appropriate rhythms from among great and small and slow and fast rhythms. Know the rhythms of spatial relations and know the rhythms of reversal. These matters are specialties of martial science. Unless you understand these rhythms of reversal, your martial artistry will not be reliable. The way to win in a battle, according to military science, is to know the rhythms of the specific opponent and use rhythms that your opponents do not expect, producing formless rhythms from rhythms of wisdom. With the science of martial arts of my individual school outlined above, by diligent practice day and night, the mind is naturally broadened. Transmitting it to the world is both collective and individual military science. I write it down for the first time in these five schools entitled Earth, Water, Fire, Wind, and Emptiness. For people who want to learn my military science, there are rules for learning the art. Number one, think of what is right and true. Number two, practice and cultivate the science. Number three, become acquainted with the arts. Number four, know the principles of the crafts. Number five, Understand the harm and benefit in everything. Number six, learn to see everything accurately. Number seven, become aware of what is not obvious. Number eight, be careful even in small matters. Number nine, do not do anything useless. Generally speaking, the science of martial arts should be practiced with such principles in mind. In this particular science, you can hardly become a master of martial arts unless you can see the immediate and a broad context. Once you've learned this principle, you should not be defeated, even in individual combat against 20 or 30 opponents. First of all, keep martial arts on your mind and work diligently in a straightforward manner. Then you can win with your hands and you can also defeat people by seeing with your eyes. Furthermore, when you refine your practice to the point where you attain freedom of the whole body, then you can overcome people by means of your body. And since your mind is trained in this science, you can also overcome people by means of mind. When you reach this point, how could you be defeated by others? Also, large-scale military science is a matter of winning and keeping good people winning at employing large numbers of people, winning at correctness of personal conduct, winning at governing nations, winning at taking care of the populace, winning at carrying out customary social observances. In whatever field or endeavor, knowledge of how to avoid losing out to others, how to help each other, how to help oneself, and how to enhance one's honor is part of military science. And that is the first book, though, the Earth Scroll. I'm going to get another drink of water or two real quick. And then I'm going to start the second scroll, which is going to be... Oh! Which is going to be the Water Scroll.
Gosh, I love water. Oh, and welcome in, said GRL. Thank you so much for coming to my stream. It means a lot that everyone here would sit here and cope with my nerdiness. I just got this book because I was wanting to find something that would be fun and nice to read on stream. And martial combat is kind of my thing, I think. Now to begin the second scroll, the water scroll. The heart of the individual Two Skies School of Martial Arts is based on water, putting the method of the art and the advantage into practice. I therefore call this the Water Scroll, in which I write about the long sword system of this individual school. It is by no means possible for me to write down the science precisely as I understand it in my heart, yet even if the words are not forthcoming, the principles should be self-evident. As for what is written down here, every single word should be given thought. If you think about it in broad outlines, you will get many things wrong. As for the principles of martial arts, although there are places in which I have written of them in terms of a duel between two individuals, it is essential to understand in terms of a battle between two armies, seeing it on a large scale. Just checking how many pages there are. Looks like there's one in nine pages total, and we are on page 17. It is essential to understand them in terms of a battle between two armies, seeing it on a large scale. In this way of life in particular, if you misperceive the path even slightly, if you stray from the right way, you fall into evil states. The science of martial arts is not just a matter of reading those writings. Taking what is written here personally, do not think you are reading or learning, and do not make up an imitation, taking the principles as if they were discovered from your own mind. Identify with them constantly and work on them carefully. In the science of martial arts, the state of mind should remain the same as normal. In ordinary circumstances, as well as when practicing martial arts, let there be no change at all with the mind open and direct, neither tense nor lax, centering the mind so that there is no imbalance. Calmly relax your mind and savor this moment of ease thoroughly so that the relaxation does not stop its relaxation for even an instant. Even when still, your mind is not still. Even when hurried, your mind is not hurried. The mind is not dragged by the body. The body is not dragged by the mind. Pay attention to the mind, not the body. Let there be neither insufficiency nor excess in your mind. Even if superficially weak-hearted, be inwardly strong-hearted, and do not let others see into your mind. It is essential for those who are physically small to know what it is like to be large, and for those who are physically large to know what it is like to be small. Whether you are physically large or small, it is essential to keep your mind free from subjective biases. Let your inner mind be unclouded and open placing your intellect on a broad plane. It is essential to polish the intellect and mind diligently. Once you have sharpened your intellect to the point where you can see whatever in the world is true or not, where you can tell whatever is good or bad, and when you are experienced in various fields and are incapable of being fooled at all by people of the world, then your mind will become imbued with the knowledge and wisdom of the art of war. There is something special about knowledge of the art of war. It is imperative to master the principles of the art of war and to learn to be unmoved in mind even in the heat of battle. As for physically appearance, your face should not be tilted downward, upward, or to the side. Your gaze should be steady. Do not wrinkle your forehead, but make a furrow between your eyebrows. Keep your eyes unmoving and try not to blink. Narrow your eyes slightly. The idea is to keep a serene expression on your face, no straight, chin slightly forward. The back of the neck should be straight and strength focused in the nape. If 
feeling the whole body from the shoulder down as one. Lower the shoulders, keep the spine straight, and do not let the buttocks stick out. Concentrate power in the lower legs from the knees down through the tips of the feet. Tense the abdomen so that the waist does not bend. There is a teaching called tightening the wedge, which means that the abdomen is braced by the scabbard of the short sword in a manner that the belt does not loosen. Generally speaking, it is essential to make your ordinary bearing the bearing you use in martial arts and to make the bearing you use in martial arts your ordinary bearing. This should be given careful consideration. The eyes are to be focused in such a way as to maximize the range and breadth of vision. Observation and perception are two separate things. The observing eye is stronger, the perceiving eye is weaker. The specialty of martial arts is to see that which is far away closely and to see that which is nearby from a distance. It is martial arts. It is important to be aware of opponent's swords and yet not look at the opponent's swords at all. The sticks work. The matter of focusing the eyes is the same in both small and large scale military signs. It is essential to see both sides without moving the eyeballs. Things like this are hard to master all at once when you're in a hurry. Remember what is written here. Constantly accustom yourself to this eye focus and to find out the state where your eye focus does not change no matter what happens. In wielding the long sword, the thumb and forefinger grip lightly. The middle finger grips neither tightly nor loosely, while the fourth and little fingers grip tightly. There should be no slackness in the hand. The long sword should be taken up with the school that has something for a killing opponents. Let there be no change in your grip, even when slashing opponents. Make your grip such that your hand does not flinch. When you strike an opponent's sword, block it, or pin it down, your thumb and forefinger alone should change somewhat, but in any case, you should grip your sword with the thought of killing. Your grip when cutting something to test your blade and your grip when slashing a combat should be no different gripping the sword as you would to kill a man. Generally speaking, fixation and binding are to be avoided in both the sword and the hand. Fixation is the way to death. Fluidity is the way to life. This is something that should be well understood. In your footwork, you should tread strongly on your heels while allowing some leeway in your toes. Though your stride may be long or short, slow or fast according to the situation, it is to be as normal. Flighty steps, unsteady steps, and stomping steps are to be avoided. <clears throat> Among the important elements of this science is what is called complementary stepping. This is essential. Complementary stepping means that you do not move one foot alone. When you slash, when you pull back, and even when you parry, you step right, left, right, left with complementary steps. Be very sure not to step with one foot alone. This is something that demands careful examination. The five kinds of guards are the upper position, the middle position, lower position, right hand guard, and left hand guard. Although the guard may be divided into five kinds, all of them are for the purpose of killing people. There are no other kinds of guard besides these five. Whatever guard you adopt, do not think of it as being on guard. Think of it as part of the act of killing. When you adopt a large or small guard, it depends on the situation. Follow whatever is most advantageous. The upper, middle, and lower positions are solid guards, while the two sides are fluid guards. The right and left guards are for places where there is no room overhead or to one side. Whether to adopt the right or the left guard is decided according to the situation. What is important in this path is to realize that the consummate guard is the middle position. The middle position is what the guard is all about. Consider it in terms of large-scale military science. The center is the seat of the general, while following the general are the four other guards. This should be examined carefully. To know the way of the longsword means that even when you are wielding your sword with two fingers, you know just how to do it and can swing it easily. When you try to swing the longsword fast, you deviate from the way of the longsword and so it is hard to swing. The idea is to swing the sword calmly, so that is easy to do. When you try to swing a long sword fast, the way you might when using a fan or a short sword, you deviate from the way of the long sword, so it is hard to swing. 
That is called short sword mincing and is ineffective for killing a man with a long sword. When you strike downwards with the long sword, bring it back up in a convenient way. When you swing it sideways, bring it back sideways, returning it in a convenient way. Extending the elbow as far as possible and swinging powerfully is the way of the long sword. First technique. In the first technique, the guard is in the middle position with the tip of the sword pointed at the opponent's face. When you close ranks with the opponent, and the opponent strikes with the long sword, counter by deflecting it to the right. When the opponent strikes again, you hit the point of his sword back up. Your sword now having bounced downwards, leave it as it is until the opponent strikes again. Whereupon, you strike the opponent's hands from below. These five formal techniques can hardly be understood by writing them about them. The five formal techniques are to be practiced with sword in hand. By means of these five outlines of swordplay, you will know my science of swordplay and the techniques employed by opponents will also be evident. This is the point of telling you that there are no more than five guards in the two sword method of swordsmanship. Training and practice are imperative. Second technique. In the second technique of the sword play, the guard is in the upper position and you strike the opponent at the very same time as the opponent tries to strike you. If your sword misses the opponent, leave it there for the moment until the opponent strikes again, whereupon you strike from below, sweeping upwards. The same principle applies when you strike once more. Within this technique are various states of mind and various rhythms. If you practice the training of my individual school by means of what lies within this technique, you will gain through knowledge of the five ways of swordplay and will be able to win under any circumstances. It requires practice. This is a really good book. I'm going to drink some more water real quick. third technique, the sword is held in the lower position with a feeling of taking matters in hand. As the opponent strikes, you strike at his hands from below. As you strike at his hands, the opponent strikes again as he tries to knock your sword down, bring it up in rhythm, then chop off his arm sideways after he is struck. The point is to strike an opponent down all at once from the lower position just as he strikes. The guard with the Sword in the lower position is something that is met with both early on and later on in the course of carrying out the science. It should be practiced with sword in hand. Fourth technique. In the guard of the fourth technique, the sword is held horizontally to the left side to hit the opponent's hands from below when he tries to strike. When the opponent tries to knock down your sword as it strikes upwards from below, block the path of the sword just like that the idea of hitting his hands and cut diagonally upwards towards your shoulder. This is the way to handle a long sword. This is also the way to win by blocking the path of the opponent's sword if he tries to strike again. This should be care considered carefully. In the fifth technique, or procedure, the sword is held horizontally to your right side. When you note the location of the opponent's attack, you swing your sword from the lower side diagonally upwards into the upper guard position and slash directly from above. This is also essential for exp expertise in the use of the long sword. When you can wield the sword according to this technique, then you can wield a heavy long sword freely. These five formal techniques are not to be written down in detail. To understand the use of the long sword in my school and also general comprehend rhythms and the discern opponent swordplay techniques, First, use these five techniques to develop your skill constantly. Even when fighting with opponents, you perfect the use of the longsword, sensing the minds of opponents, using various rhythms, gaining victory in any way. This requires careful discernment. 
Having a position without a position or a guard without a guard means that the longsword is not supposed to be kept in a fixed position. Nevertheless, since there are five ways of placing the sword, the guard positions must follow along. Where you hold your sword depends on your relationship to the opponent, depends on the place, and must conform to the situation wherever you hold it. The idea is to hold it so that it will be easy to kill the opponent. Sometimes the upper guard position is lower to bend so that it becomes the middle position, while the middle guard position may be elevated a bit, depending on the advantage thereof, so that it becomes the upper position at times. The lower guard position is also raised a bit to become the middle position. The two side guard positions may also be moved somewhat towards the center, depending on where you are standing via vis your opponent, resulting in either the middle or lower guard position. In this way, the principle is to have a guard position without a position. First of all, when you take up the sword, in any case, the idea is to kill an opponent. Even though you may catch, hit, or block an opponent's slashing sword, or tie it up, or obstruct it, all these moves are opportunities for cutting the opponent down. This must be understood. If you think of catching, think of hitting, think of blocking, think of tying up, or thinking of obstructing, you will therefore become unable to make the kill. It is crucial to think of everything as an opportunity to kill. This should be given careful consideration. In large-scale military science, the arraying of troops is also a matter of positioning. Every instance thereof is an opportunity to win in war. Fixation is bad. This should be worked out thoroughly. Among the rhythms used to strike an opponent, there is what is called a single beat, finding a position where you can reach your opponents, realizing when the opponent has not yet determined what to do, you strike directly as fast as possible without moving your body or fixing your attention. The stroke with which you strike an opponent before he has thought of whether to pull back, parry, or strike is called the single beat. Once you have learned this rhythm well, you should practice striking the intervening stroke quickly. The rhythm of the second spring is when you are about to strike and the opponent quickly pulls back or parries. You feint a blow and then strike the opponent as he relaxes after tensing. This is the stroke of the second swing. It will be very difficult to accomplish the stroke just by reading this book. It is something that you understand all of a sudden when you receive instruction. When your opponent is going to strike and you are also going to strike, your body is on the offensive and your mind is also on the offensive. Your hands come spontaneously from space, striking with added speed and force. This is called striking without thought or form and is the most important stroke. This stroke is encountered time and time again. It is something that needs to be learned well and refined in practice. The flowing water stroke is used when you are going toe to toe with an opponent. When the opponent tries to pull away quickly, dodge quickly, or parry your sword quickly, becoming expansive in body and mind, you swing your sword from behind you in an utterly relaxed manner, as if there were some hesitation, and strike with a large and powerful stroke. <clears throat> Once you have learned the stroke, it is certainly easy to strike. It is essential to discern the opponent's position. When you launch an offensive and the opponent tries to stop it or parry it, you strike at his head, hands and feet with one stroke. Striking wherever you can with one swoop of the longsword is called the chance hit. When you learn the stroke, it is one that is always useful. It is something that requires precise discernment in the course of dueling. The spark hit is when your opponent's sword and your sword are locked together and you strike as strongly as possible without raising your sword at all. One must strike quickly, exerting strength with the legs, torso, and hands. This blow is hard to strike without repeated practice. If you cultivate it to perfection, it has a powerful impact. The idea of the crimson foliage hit is to knock the opponent's sword down and take the sword over. When an opponent is brandishing a sword before you, intending to strike, hit, or catch, you strike the opponent's sword strongly. Your striking mode, that of striking without thought, without form, or even spark hitting. When you then follow up closely on that, striking with the sword tip downwards, 
Kisaki Sagari, your opponent's sword will inevitably fall. If you cultivate this blow to perfection, it is easy to knock a sword down. It must be well practiced. I'm going to finish this page and I think I'm going to close it up for the night. I had a work day today and my throat kind of hurts. The body in this sense can also be called the body that which that takes the place of the sword. In general, when you take the offensive, your sword and your body are not launched simultaneously. Depending on your chances of striking the opponent, you first adopt an offensive posture with your body, and your sword strikes independently of your body. Sometimes you may strike with your sword without your body stirring, but generally the body goes on the offensive first, followed up by the stroke of the sword. This requires careful observation and practice. By striking and hitting, I mean two different things. The sense of striking is that whatever stroke you employ, you make a deliberate and certain strike. Hitting means something like running into someone. Even if you hit an opponent so hard that he dies on the spot, this is a hit. A strike is when you consciously and deliberately strike the blow you intend to strike. This requires examination and reflection. To hit an opponent on the on the hands or legs means to hit first in order to make a powerful strike after hitting. To the hit, no. to hit means something like feel out. If you really learn to master this, it is something extraordinary. It takes work. The posture of the short-armed monkey means not reaching out with your hand. The idea is that when you close in on an opponent. You get in there quickly before the opponent strikes without putting forth a hand at all. When you intend to reach forth, your body invariably pulls back, so the idea is to move the whole body quickly to get inside the opponent's defense. It is easy to get in from arm's length. This should be investigated carefully. The sticky body means getting inside and sticking fast to an opponent. When you get inside the opponent's defenses, you stick tight with your head, body, and legs. The average person gets his head and legs in quickly, but the body shrinks back. Sticking to an opponent means that you stick so closely that there is no gap between your bodies. This should be investigated carefully. Comparing height means that when you close in on an opponent under whatever circumstances, you extend your legs, waist, and neck so that your body does not contract. Closing in powerfully, you align your face with the opponents as if you were comparing height and proving to be the taller of the two. The essential point is to maximize your height and close in strongly. This requires careful work. When your opponent and you both strike forth and your opponent catches your blow, the idea is to close in with your sword glued to the opponent's sword. Gluing means that the sword is hard to get away from. You should close in without too much force. Sticking to the opponent's sword as if glued, when you move in close, it does not matter how quietly you move in. There is gluing and there is leaning. Gluing is stronger than leaning. These things must be distinguished. The body blow is when you close in on an opponent's side and hit him with your body. Turning your face slightly to the side and thrusting your left shoulder forward, you hit him in the chest. In making the hit, exert as much strength as possible with your body. In making the hit, the idea is to close in with a bound at the moment of peak tension. Once you have learned to close in like this, you can knock an opponent several yards back. It is even possible to hit an opponent so hard that he dies. This requires careful training and practice. When you attack an opponent in order to parry the blow of the opponent's sword, making as if to stab him in the eyes, you dash a sword to your right with your sword, thus parrying it. There is also what is called the stabbing parry. Making as if to stab the opponent in the right eye with the idea of clipping off his neck, you parry the opponent's striking sword with a stabbing thrust. Also, when an opp opponent strikes you and you close him with a shorter sword without paying so much attention to the parrying sword, you close him as if to hit your opponent in the face with your left hand. These are the three parries. Making your left hand into a fist, you should think of it as if you were punching your opponent in the face. That is something that requires thorough training and practice. 
when you are even with an opponent, it is essential to keep thinking of stabbing him in the face with the tip of your sword in the intervals between the opponent's sword blows and your own sword blows. When you have the intention of stabbing your opponent in the face, he will try to get both his face and his body out of the way. When you can get your opponent to shrink away, there are various advantages to which you can avail yourself to win. You should work this out thoroughly. In the midst of battle, as soon as an opponent tries to get out of the way, you have already won. Therefore, it is imperative not to forget about the tactic of stabbing the face. This should be cultivated in the course of practicing martial arts. Stabbing the heart is used when fighting in a place where there is no room for slashing, either overhead or to the sides, so you stab the opponent. To make the opponent's sword miss you, the idea is to turn the ridge of your sword directly towards your opponent, drawing it back so that the tip of the sword does not go off kilter and thrusting it into the opponent's chest. This move is essential for when you are tired out or when your sword will not cut. It is imperative to be able to discern expertly. The cry and the shout are used whenever you launch an attack to overcome an opponent, and the opponent also strikes back. Coming up from below as if to stab the opponent, you strike a counter blow. In any case, you strike with a cry and a shout in rapid succession. The idea is to thrust upwards with a cry, then strike with a shout. This move is one that can be used any time in a duel. The way to cry and shout is to raise the tip of the sword with the sense of stabbing, then slashing all at once immediately upon bringing it up. <coughs> the rhythm must be practiced well and examined carefully. When you're exchanging blows with an opponent in a duel, You must hit the opponent's sword with your own sword as he strikes. This is called the slapping parry. The idea of the slapping parry is not to hit particularly hard, nor to catch and block, responding immediately to the opponent's striking sword. You hit the striking sword, then immediately strike the opponent. This is essential to be the first to hit and the first to strike. If the rhythm of your parrying blow is right, no matter how powerfully an opponent strikes, as long as you have no intention at all of hitting, your sword tip will not fall. This must be learned by practice and carefully examined. A stand against many opponents is when an individual fights against a group. Drawing both long and short swords, short swords, you hold them out to the left and right, extending them horizontally. The idea is that even if opponents come at you from all four sides, you chase them into one place. Discerning the order in which opponents attack, deal with those who press forward first keeping an eye on the whole picture, determining the stance from which opponents launch their attacks, swinging both swords at the same time without mutual interference. It is wrong to wait. The idea is to immediately adopt the ready position with both swords out to the sides, and when an opponent comes forward, to cut him with a powerful attack, overpower him, then turn right away to the next one to come forth and slash him down, intent on hurting opponents into a line when they seem intent when doubling up, sweep right and powerfully, not allowing a moment's gap. It would be hard to make headway if you only chase opponents around en masse. Then again, if you think about getting them one after another as they come forth, you will have a sense of waiting and so will also have a hard time making headway. The thing is to win by sensing the opponent's rhythms and by knowing whether they break down. If you get a group of practitioners together from time to time and learn how to corner them, it's possible to take one opponent, or ten, or even twenty opponents with peace of mind. It requires thorough practice and examination. Advantage in dueling means understanding how to win using the longsword according to the laws of martial arts. This cannot be written down in detail. One must realize how to win by practice. This is the use of the longsword that reveals the true science of martial arts. It is transmitted by word of mouth. This means to gain victory with a certainty by the accuracy of a single stroke. This cannot be comprehended without learning martial arts well. If you practice this well, you will master martial arts, and this will be a way to attain victory as well. Study carefully. The mind of direct penetration is something that is transmitted when one receives the true path of the school of two swords. It is essential to practice well so as to train the body to this military science. This is transmitted orally. 
The above is an overall account of the art of swordsmanship in my individual school, which I have recorded in this scroll. In military science, this is the way to learn how to take up the longsword and gain victory over others. Starts use using the five formal techniques to learn the five kinds of guard position, then learning how to wield a longsword and gain total freedom of moment, sharpening the mind to discern the rhythms of the path, and taking up the sword oneself. When you are able to maneuver your body and feet however you wish, you beat one person, you beat two people, and you come to know what is good and what is bad in martial arts. Studying and practicing each item in this book, fighting with opponents, you gradually attain the principles of the science, keeping it in mind at all times without any sense of hurry. Learning its virtues, whenever the opportunity arises, it's taking on any and all opponents and duels, learning the heart of the science, even though it is a path of a thousand miles, you walk one step at a time. Thinking unhurriedly, Understanding it is the duty of warriors to practice the science, determine that today you will overcome yourself of the day before. Tomorrow you will win over those of lesser skill, and later you will win over those of greater skill. Practicing in accord with this book, you should determine not to let your mind get sidetracked. No matter how many opponents you beat, as long as you do anything in contravention of training, it cannot be the true path. When this principle comes to mind, you would understand how to overcome even dozens of opponents by yourself. Once you can do that, you should also be able to grasp the principles of large-scale and individual military sciences by means of the power of knowledge of the art of the sword. This is something that requires thorough examination, the thousand days of practice for training, and ten thousand days of practice for refinement. And that is the first two scrolls of the book. That was the Earth Scroll, and that was also the Water Scroll. On my next stream, I'm going to start reading the Fire Scroll. And if my throat is feeling good, we're going to try and work our way through the book. Thank you so much for coming to listen, everyone that's here. 2020, another TTV viewer, Commander Root, Discord for Small Streamers, and Sad Girl. Thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and end the stream, and I hope you all have a good night or good morning wherever you are. Uh, sayonara, mi amigos. I'm gonna log off. Bye.